Hi everyone, this is Mr. Money, and for this lesson we're going to be taking a look at several glands of the endocrine system, the hormones that they produce, and the effects those hormones have on homeostasis. Let's start by taking a look at the pituitary gland and its role in a process called osmoregulation. Now the pituitary gland, like I mentioned earlier, it produces a lot of hormones. It is located in the base of our brain, at the very, very bottom of a section called the hypothalamus, which is the control center of a lot of different parts of our brain, and it also produces some hormones itself as well. But the pituitary gland is often called the master gland because it produces many hormones that control other glands. So for example, the pituitary gland will produce hormones that will stimulate the thyroid gland, producing their hormones. Or the pituitary gland will produce hormones that will stimulate the ovaries, producing estrogen and progesterone. And so uh, it's called the master gland for that reason. But one of the hormones that it secretes is a hormone that directly controls urine production. So it's a hormone that essentially can control our blood volume because how much urine we produce basically determines how much water is in our body and therefore how much volume our blood has, as well as the osmolarity of our blood, how watery our blood is. So that hormone is called antidiuretic hormone, also called uh, vasopressin. So you all should have access to maybe this diagram within your notes so that you can use it to maybe summarize the information that I'm going to give you. But I'm going to go through the process of osmoregulation step by step in this next slide. So it all would start with a stimulus. And in this case, a stimulus would be an increase in blood osmolarity. In other words, our blood becomes too full of solutes. There is just not enough water to dilute the solutes that are in our blood, or at least there's less water than what is optimal. And this is actually detected by a gland that you're familiar with, the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is a center of our brain that is actually responsible for regulating a lot of our processes that keeps us alive. We learned about the hypothalamus as being our thermostat last lesson. Well, it's also our osmoregulator. There's osmoreceptors within our hypothalamus that can detect when our blood becomes not diluted enough. So essentially, we don't measure the blood volume. What we can measure is blood osmolarity. We can measure how dilute our blood is. And when our blood is not dilute, in turn, that might mean that we have less blood volume, which means that we are dehydrated. So the effects of these osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus detecting this high osmolarity is twofold. The first effect is going to be hormonal, and they're going to stimulate the release of a hormone called antidiuretic hormone, uh, also called vasopressin, by a gland that is attached to the hypothalamus called the pituitary gland. The vasopressin, or an antidiuretic hormone, in turn will go to the kidneys through our blood, and in the kidneys, they will stimulate the increased reabsorption of water by the kidneys, in turn making us produce less urine and more concentrated urine. Let me explain. Our kidneys are responsible for producing our urine, and they do so by filtering our blood and reabsorbing back into our circulatory system, back into our blood, a lot of the things that we don't want to get rid of. So we reabsorb a lot of our nutrients, and since we don't want to get rid of all of our water, we reabsorb a lot of our water. And so a big part of urine production is reabsorption. If we didn't reabsorb most of the water that goes into our kidneys, we would be peeing out most of our water. And so one of the ways by which reabsorption of water at the kidneys can be controlled is hormonally by antidiuretic hormone, just increases the reabsorption of water by our kidneys, which makes us have less urine production and more concentrated urine. And so think about any time you've been dehydrated. You probably don't go pee as often. Your kidneys are producing less urine. And your urine, when it is produced, is much more concentrated less watery, and in lesser volume. This is the result of antidiuretic hormone. The other effect is a behavioral effect, and that is basically the behavior that of drinking water. We feel thirst, and as a result, we drink more water. And so if you listen to your body, and you actually do drink water when you feel thirsty, both the increasing water intake and the decrease in urine production should reestablish osmolarity, and therefore stop the production of antidiuretic hormone. So one interesting thing about antidiuretic hormone is that our body produces more antidiuretic hormone right before bedtime. 
And this is the reason why we don't pee our beds after a certain age. Because as we mature, our body basically gets into some sort of rhythm. And right before it's time to go to bed, antidiuretic hormone levels increase so that you don't have to go to the bathroom and go pee in the middle of the night. And you can basically hold your bladder for the night because your urine production is lessened. Some children who are still suffering from bedwetting, it might be due to an underdeveloped pituitary gland. Doctors sometimes actually recommend and prescribe hormones, and they prescribe antidiuretic hormone so that the child will take antidiuretic hormone right before bed, and so it can reduce bedwetting. Sometimes we can drink or consume things called diuretics. Diuretics essentially block antidiuretic hormone, so things like coffee or alcohol are diuretics. So what they do is they block antidiuretic hormone, and as a result, they cause us to pee a lot and can lead to dehydration. Okay, so let's take a look at the opposite real quick. Let's say instead of us being thirsty, we drank way too much water, our blood osmolarity is too low, and there's just too much dilution within our blood. We just have too much blood volume. This actually can in turn lead to maybe hypertension or high blood pressure and so on. So once again, control center is in the hypothalamus, and in this case, it's going to reduce the production of antidiuretic hormone, and that's going to lead to a decreased water reabsorption, more watery urine, more urine being produced, blood osmolarity will then be reestablished, and again, it's a negative feedback mechanism. Next, let's take a look at what happens to our pancreas and how we can control blood sugar levels. So the pancreas is an interesting organ because it is a gland that produces both hormones and a whole bunch of enzymes that are used during our digestive system. Of course, for this lesson and for this unit, we're focusing on hormones. So there are two main hormones that are produced by the pancreas, and both of them play a very important role in blood sugar control. And the hormones are called glucagon and insulin. You're probably more familiar with insulin than with glucagon. Glucagon and insulin are both produced by cells found within a cluster called the islets of Langerhans, which are tiny little clusters within the pancreas that are there to produce these hormones. There are two types of cells within the islets of Langerhans, alpha cells and beta cells. Alpha cells produce glucagon, beta cells produce insulin. So glucagon and insulin essentially have opposite roles to play. Glucagon promotes the breakdown of glycogen into glucose, and is stimulated by low blood sugar. So whenever our blood sugar levels go too low, then glucagon is secreted by the pancreas, and it promotes the increase in sugar in our blood by essentially allowing our cells to turn glycogen, which remember from the first unit is the way by which our cells can store glucose for the shorter term into glucose. Insulin, on the other hand, is stimulus is the opposite, is high blood sugar, let's say, for example, from a meal. And what it does is it promotes the absorption of glucose by cells in our body. So, and therefore, by cells absorbing the glucose that is in our blood, it, it exits our blood, and therefore, it lowers blood glucose levels. Both insulin and glucagon are produced throughout the day, and they have, as you can see, opposite effects in the body. And blood sugar levels do not remain constant throughout the day. So as you can see this graph right here, this dotted line is the set point, the ideal blood sugar levels that we would want to have. But we're not going to keep that steady. It fluctuates throughout the day. And so maybe you wake up at 7 in the morning and your blood sugar levels are going to be lower than that. Why? Because, well, you've been sleeping all night and so you haven't been eating all night and your blood sugar levels are not going to be too, too low because over the night you've been able to regulate a little bit of your blood sugar levels by, by converting some fats into sugars and by converting glycogen if you still have it into sugars, but it's still going to be below that set point. And so you would probably, as soon as you wake up, would have your first meal, which would be breakfast, and in turn you would break your fast and your blood sugar levels would go up. And in response to that, your body would produce insulin, blood sugar levels would go down, and in response to that, your body would produce glucagon, which would make blood sugar levels go up, and so on and so forth. Blood sugar levels cannot go back up unless you still have glycogen stores. So glucagon can only affect blood sugar levels if there's glycogen stored within your liver or your muscle cells. So let's take a look at each of those two 
show the negative feedback mechanism. So here's a picture that summarizes both of these actions, but let's kind of take a look at it in more detail. So let's start with a stimulus, and the stimulus might be you had breakfast, you had a meal, and now your blood sugar levels are higher than the set point. As a response to that increase in blood sugar levels, your blood is going to produce insulin. And the control center for that is going to be your pancreas itself. There are glucose receptors within the pancreas, which then will stimulate the production of insulin by the beta cells in the pancreas itself. This will in turn increase the absorption of glucose by the body cells and also, it will increase the production of glycogen by both the liver and muscle cells. So insulin can go both into your general tissues to absorb glucose for cellular respiration and ATP production, and your liver and your muscle cells to stimulate the absorption of glucose so that glycogen can be stored as well. And once the blood glucose level go back to the set point, then the pancreas will stop producing insulin. On the other hand, when blood glucose levels go down, let's say, for example, after exercise or if it's been too long after a meal, your control center, which is the pancreas, will once again detect that there is now, in this case, not enough sugar in your bloodstream and is going to stimulate the release of glucagon by the alpha cells, which will in turn go to the liver and stimulate the production of glucose from glycogen. So the breakdown of glycogen into glucose in both the liver and the muscle cells, which then in turn will release glucose into the blood, which would increase blood glucose levels and negative feedback response again. It would then go send a signal to the pancreas to stop producing glucagon. Now, type 1 diabetes, which is what often called juvenile diabetes and is also the least common type of diabetes, is one that occurs when the pancreas simply stops the production of insulin. It, can, it loses its beta cells, so it can no longer produce insulin. The cause of it is unknown. It is believed to be an autoimmune disease. It might be triggered by a virus, but we are not sure. And so essentially a child, and it's usually a child, it's not always, but it's usually it presents itself before adulthood, will wake up one day without beta cells and without the ability to produce insulin. And then symptoms will develop slowly as the, basically the body starts to accumulate too much sugar and all the other symptoms of high blood sugar or hyperglycemia appear. A treatment for type 1 diabetes is daily insulin injections, constant blood sugar monitoring, and then insulin injections with every meal so that when they eat food, uh, they can inject themselves with insulin so that the food, the sugar in the food can be absorbed into the bloodstream. Although nowadays with insulin pumps, that can be sort of automated so that the insulin pump can detect changes in blood sugar levels and then release as much insulin as needed. Less than 10% of diabetics are type 1 diabetics. Most of them are actually type 2 diabetics. And type 2 diabetes is called adult onset diabetes, although more and more nowadays children are also developing this disease. And this is a disease caused by lifestyle choices, usually a poor diet and obesity, which in turn is not about not being able to produce insulin, but about the effectiveness of insulin. So insulin is produced maybe not in the same quantities, maybe this decreased production of insulin, but even if insulin is produced, it's not effective enough. If you think of insulin as a key that opens the doors in our cells, in the, in the transport proteins in our cells that allow glucose to enter, type 1 diabetes would be like losing your key factory. So you no longer can produce the keys that will open the doorway so that glucose can enter your cells. Type 2 diabetes would be like a defective key factory. Your key factory is under producing keys and the keys that are being produced are either not working very well, but also most likely than not, there's something wrong with the locks. And this is due to the overuse of those locks over a lifetime. If you're constantly producing a lot of insulin, overproducing insulin because of a, a high sugar diet, then that insulin is overly opening those doors, eventually there's going to be wear and tear. So caused usually by a variety of factors, often lifestyle factors like obesity, diet, hypertension, which is high blood pressure, but there's also genetics plays a role. Sometimes people can become diabetic during pregnancy, but then as soon as the baby is born, the diabetes disappears. 
Treatment is usually diet, exercise, and medications that can control blood sugar levels, and about 90% of diabetics are type 2 diabetics. So for the next part, or part 2 of this lesson, we will be looking at the endocrine system as it relates to our reproductive hormones.